Writing for Humans, Designing Better Software by Keeping Humanity in Mind, by Mike Moore. Um, so, yeah, uh, my talk was something about, uh, you know, emergent design, um, kind of humanity and software. And that's kind of really what I want to talk about. Um, I was planning on having lots of solid, lots of code in the slides and ended up not having any. Uh, but I just finished, like, about 10 minutes ago. So I haven't really gone through it yet, so I'm not sure how long this will take. I, I think it's gonna take like 10 minutes, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, so, a small disclaimer, um, I'm a Ruby guy. Uh, this kind of how I come to Agile is kind of through Ruby. Um, and so because of that, I'm kind of apathetic towards Agile. I don't really uh, identify myself with Agile. I, I love the XP practices, but um, I'm not really a culture warrior, which is kind of <laughs> ironic since I'm gonna be talking a lot about culture today. Um, but, I, what I found in Ruby is, is I think there's a worldview that is not held by the majority that informs where Agile came from. And I think that that worldview, um, like I said, is a minority worldview. It's not the majority worldview. And that's something that uh, I think we've lost. And I don't really hear us talking too much about it. And so those are some of the things I'm going to talk about. And I've heard a lot of talking around this today, but I haven't actually heard someone actually talk directly about this. And that was kind of the point I wanted to get out with this. So, Ruby guy, uh, you know, I, you know, you guys could be like the most famous Agile people in the world, and I would have no idea because I'm oblivious to that. All right. So, uh, what is software? So, what do you guys do for? Oh, actually, before I start, how many people here are programmers? Uh, that's like 90 percent. All right. Um, you guys, another question. Another question. people here have been in Agile for like more than a year or more than two years? Oh, so like about half. All right. So you're not the old guard. You're not like the, you know, you're not tired of all this yet, right? So, so that's kind of good because I'm, I'm trying not to be kind of jaded and uh, tired of it. So um, maybe we'll have something to talk about that. Because uh, I have a feeling I might be kind of like retreading a bunch of stuff that was like discovered in 2002. All right. So uh, this is the SICP. In the, the preface of this, it, I love the preface. Um, I like prefaces in general because they really tell you what you're going to learn in the book. And they've got the juiciest quotes in it. So uh, in it, there's a series of quotes that I absolutely love talking about what software is. That was the question I was going to ask before. So um, let's do some interaction. You know, let's kinda, uh, at, at the end of the day, so let's kind of wake up. Um, what is software, right? So if you're, ex you know, you're explaining it to your aunt, you see like every four years, She's like, oh, what do you do? What do you say? What is software? Say what you have to say. I, yeah. For me, software is what I tell a computer to do and in a way that other people can understand what I'm telling them. So it's instructions? So it's instructions to the computer and hints to those who have to alter the instructions okay. later. So instructions to the computer and hints to people around you. Yeah, that's, right. All right. That, that's what it is for me. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody have something other than that? Kind of very machine oriented? Yeah. Usually, if somebody asks in more detail what I do, um, it's usually more effective to tell them what the software does than what I do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's not just instructions for a machine, but it actually does something useful. And you, if you're going to help people understand what that is, then you want them to understand why it's useful to them. So you enable some sort of utility right. for someone to use a machine. Making a computer more than a paperweight is how I want to describe it. How I'm writing something. Making a computer more than a paperweight. Oh, <laughs> making the machine worth something and not just yes. something heavy. Put right. on software, my computer or something more than a heavy piece of junk. Expensive. Heavy piece. Yeah, expensive. All right, so in, in the SICP, the preface it says, um, again, this is to teach uh, unsuspecting MIT people how to program. Underlying this, our approach to this subject of learning how to program is our conviction that computer science is not a science and that its significance has little to do with computers. The computer revolution is a revolution in the way we think and in the way we express what we think. And the word I want to highlight. Oh, oh no. That really, can you, can you guess the difference between that? Think. <laughs> no. No? Or? Yeah, it was a uh, thing. It's kind of highlighting things. And think. Kind of yeah. It was, yeah. All right. Uh, it continues. We 
we want to establish the idea that a computer language is not just a way of getting a computer to perform operations, uh, but rather that it is a novel formal medium for expressing ideas about methodologies. Thus, programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. So it kind of flips that, right? It's not necessarily instructions, it's really for the people around you. Again, the thing is, what do I want to highlight here? People, that's the word that's highlighted. We believe that the essential material to be addressed by, by a subject at this level is not the syntax of a particular programming <coughs> language construct, nor clever algorithms for computing particular functions efficiently, nor even the mathematical analysis of algorithms and the foundations of computing, but rather the techniques used to control the intellectual complexity of large software systems. And the word that I really want to highlight here is intellectual complexity. In my mind, that's what software is. In my mind, we are workers of ideas. We are organizers of intelligence. Is what we do. This is what software is. This is what makes software so completely and radically different than everything that's come before, right? Because if you're a structural engineer, you're dealing with you know actual materials, right? Here, us, we're dealing with ideas, and ideas are really tricky things. So, intellectual complexity. Um, our goal is to create intelligence for our own ends, right? That's what we're here for. We're here to put it together and make it do something awesome for us. And like I said, it's not easy, right? Like we crash space shuttles and I mean, there's all, look at the horrible things that software has done to the world, right? Um, because it's very, very difficult. But I think maybe we make it a little more difficult than it needs to be. All right, so what is intelligence, right? If software is uh, intellectual complexity, what is intelligence? What do you guys think it is? Anything? So uh, the Apple dictionary definition on my computer says the, it is the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skill. Okay. It's an ability, it's not a possession, right? So it's not even something we really have, right? It's the potential of things that, that might be, right? That's intelligence. And that's what we're working with, right? And uh, I don't know, that, that makes me kind of proud to do what I do. All right, and I'm shift gears just a little bit. Um, so it's not uh, what you already have, that's what intelligence is not something you already have. It's the ability, right? It's the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skill, right? It's not a skill, it's not knowledge, it's the ability to do something with it. That is intelligence. All right, so we're gonna shift gears because this is a, an agile conference. And this is only the second one I've been to. I was at the one last year, and I was on the panel, and I said, yeah, I think agile is dying. Um, and so like my uh, agile conference experience is kind of, is, uh, kind of colored by that. I'm not sure what real agile conference is supposed to be. All right. Welcome to the second generation. <laughs> All right, one, one of the things that I actually really like about agile um, like I said, I don't really like the cultural warrior type thing, uh, but I do like kind of where it came from. I like uh, uh, how it was started. You know, as my understanding is uh, where Alistair Coburn came from, right? He was working for IBM. They said, why does some, some software, why do some teams work and why do some teams not work? And so he got to fly all over the world and observe, right? Observation is pretty cool. Um, there's a lot that we can learn by observation. And when we observe teams that are successful, um, what do we observe, right? You know, a lot of what I see coming out of Agile is a lot of tools and techniques, right? And it's from observation of teams that have succeeded, right? But one of the things this doesn't uh, tell me is what was their thought process going into coming up with a certain technique or, you know, what was the thought process in deciding that this tool was necessary, that they're gonna create this tool, or they're gonna use it in this particular way, right? We don't know what they were thinking. All we have is the observation of what they did, you know, which you can learn from that, but 
you're not really going to change your thinking very easily just by copying behavior, copying uh, um, other people's uh, actions. Okay. Um, what we really want to learn is we want to know how they think. Like I said, I think Agile came from somewhere. Agile didn't just emerge, right? Agile came out of something, right? And if we understand that something, I think we'll be a lot better in Agile. All right, so, uh, wait, more notes. Um, okay, so how can we learn to think like them? Right? How do we, if you look at the people that signed the manifesto, at, you know, the Alistair Coburn's, the Bob Martin's, the Ryan Merritt's, the Dave Thomas's and Andy Hunt's, how do we become like them, right? And that's a really difficult question. That's one of the things that I've been struggling for a really long time, is how do I emulate that, right? Is it just enough to buy the books and to you know, read their blogs and try and talk it like them? I don't think it is. I think the missing element is culture. This is the thing that separates the men from the boys that do Right? This is the thing that gets you over that conceptual hump. And culture means an awful lot to me. Like I said, I'm a Ruby guy. Um, I, I kind of fell into Ruby about five years ago at a real low point in my career. I was, really, I was ready to kind of walk away because the joy wasn't there anymore. And uh, you know, I, I, I saw this you know, pretty early, before Rails 1, I saw this article about Rails. Um, and I was a web guy, I decided I should look into it. And then what really got me was Ruby, right? I just fell in love with the language. It made a lot of things click and make sense. I'll get into that a little bit later. But the thing that really helped me more than anything was the culture, right? Ruby's got a tremendous culture. Um, they've got a lot of things that just um, are just really, really wonderful. There's a, there's a saying in, in the Ruby culture, Minaswan. And uh, that means Matt's is nice, and so we are nice. Matt's is the creator of Ruby, right? Because he's a nice guy on the mailing list, we're supposed to be nice to everyone else, right? Um, but that's kind of infected the Ruby culture. Ruby is a very, very nice culture because of that. Culture matters a lot, right? It's not a zero-sum game, right? There are aspects to the Ruby culture that make Ruby a better programming language. Um, so anyways, it's important. Don't ignore the culture, right? If you're a, if you're a Java shop, that culture of Java is informing your team and how they behave. Right? If you are a large enterprise, that culture is informing your team and how they behave. Right? Culture is, is extremely important. You need to learn about the culture. Right? You need to embrace it in most instances. Um, and the, the thing about the culture that I think was unique and where Agile came from was objects. Agile came out of the object culture. Agile came out of a fundamental understanding about objects that we just don't see very much, right? Those guys, Kent Beck and Malmo Crew, they had a much different view of what objects is, what objects are, than I think what we do today, right? And I think it's a real shame that we kind of miss out on uh, this different way of thinking about objects. All right, so. Um, The other thing about the culture is, I mean, it's, it, it, you have to kind of equate it with the small talk culture. I don't, I don't think it's like 100% overlap there, right? Um, but I think at that point in time, they were really just being attacked on all sides by the C++'s and the Java's. Um, and you know, regardless of all of the pressure that they had on them, they still moved the entire industry, right? They got together up at Snowbird, they said, here are the things that we believe. And because it was easy enough to understand, they moved the entire industry, right? even though they were kind of losing the language. <laughs> okay. Um, here's a quote from Gray Bruch. I really like this a lot. Let there be no doubt that object-oriented design is fundamentally different than traditional structured design approaches. It requires a different way of thinking about decomposition, and it produces software architectures that are largely outside the realm of structured design culture. Okay? It's going to be different. If you're doing what you think is object-oriented code and it looks a lot like structured code, you're doing it wrong. Right? 
the benefits in the 80s that were talked about of, of, of object orientation was like an order of magnitude less code and better performance, right? That means if you've got a million line C application, it would be 100,000 lines of object oriented code and it would perform better, right? So how does that happen? That's the promise and different studies that have shown that, right? And the way, the reason is because it's a completely different way of thinking, right? And sometimes I don't think we emphasize that enough. You have to think about it. So, I mean, they're not just smarter than us, right? I think there's a lot of really smart people in this room. I'm certainly not, you know, the, I'm not even in the top half of the smartest people in this room. I would be willing to wager. Um, but I can do what they do, right? And it's not because they're smarter, it's just because they get to think a little bit differently about it. That's the key. So, what is an object? Who can tell me what an object is? Anybody? Traditional definition. Sure. Or whatever. What's an object? Encapsulation of state. Encapsulation of state and behavior. And identity. Okay, like that, right? Yeah. Pretty close. Right. You have data. This is like your your encapsulation boundary, right? Here are all the operations working on your data. Right. Is there anything else that we think about about objects as people are leaving the room? Yes. It, it usually represents something tangible, I guess. I, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. But, but, but it's not just state as in some <coughs> arbitrary value, but it actually ha it has information that has value because it means something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Belongs to a classification. Interesting. Yes, I'll talk about that later. An abstraction. Right, so, so sometimes we think about objects as, oh, you guys can't see that, as a black box, right? Um, sometimes like a, you know, if you're old school, like an integrated circuit, right, you're kind of going to reuse that. That's an object. It's a person, right? Think of objects as people. This is the, this is the big change, the big difference uh, in how I have approached programming is I think of objects as people. And as I'm in my object, as I'm adding code to it, as I'm adding new features, I'm changing behavior, in my mind is always like, how does this object feel, right? Like, do I just take this object and physically lift it up and put it somewhere, right? Or do I ask it nicely to move, right? To go clean their room, to stop pulling their sister's hair. This is a big word called anthropomorphization. Right. I'm not sure if I said that right. Um, but this means attributing human motivation, character, characteristics, behavior to non human organisms or inanimate objects. Right? And we see a lot of this in our culture. Right? Like Toy Story. Is Toy Story open this week, I think so. Something like that, right? That's like the perfect you know, example of anthropomorphization. <laughs> Right? Your toys come alive. Something that's not living comes alive. Or Bugs Bunny, something that is alive, but you know, walks and talks like a person. Right? You can reason with it, you can have conversation with it, you can ask it things, right? and it responds. It has a life of its own. Um, so when we're code, when we're implementing features, responding to our customer's request, um, we need to be thinking like an object, or like our object is thinking. Right? If this was a living, breathing person, how would they feel? Um, it's really tempting uh, when I code to want to think like a machine, right? I want to think like this is just a sequence of commands I just want it to do, right? And I want to make sure that I, I'm not like, you know, I'm not printing memory leaks. So I'm going to do this thing in this you know, special order because I'm, I'm manipulating something that's running, right? Um, and I think that's the difference between structured programming and object-oriented programming, right? You need to break out, or you need to kind of put away the idea of the machine and start dealing with your code as, uh, as people, as humans. Um, that kind of means also you should honor their boundaries, right? And we'll, we'll talk a little about that a little later. Um, 
think about this is it's like super hard though, right? And not only do you have to like get you to do it, but then you have to get like everyone else around you to do it, all your teammates to do it. You know, and it's like the hardest thing in the world to say, well, yeah, we could you could add this, you know, function to this piece of code, but you know, I don't think that the cloud should really appreciate it. I don't think you'd like it. You might be kind of mad, but that's kind of a hard thing for him to do, right? Because he wants to be lazy, he just wants to kind of do what he does and not worry about you know the responsibilities or what's being asked of something over in this part of the application, you know. Um, and yeah, sometimes people don't like to uh, when you start talking about code that way. The other thing about this is it's really counterintuitive, you know. But I got news for you guys: agile is counterintuitive as hell, right? I cannot get people to even try it, right? This, this way of thinking has informed the culture of which, from which Agile came from, right? A lot of these ideas are just assumed in the literature of Agile, right? But maybe not something that we necessarily recognize or something we give enough weight to. Um, and I think a lot of that is because we came from procedural code. I mean, who learned to code using a procedural language or using a C-based language? Okay, who did not raise their hand? One person. Lisp? <laughs> Lisp? Java. Java? No, that's a C-based code. C-based language. Okay. All right. So everybody, right? We all learn it. This is, this is how we learn. I mean, I remember, uh, I remember being in college, and uh, I had taken C and Pascal, and I was taking intro to, <coughs> to computer science. And this was, wow. Um, this is before, um, the STL of Alpha C++ was so like basically the C for classes. And I remember just like not getting why you would add so much overhead to your C code, right? For like zero benefit. It's like, why would I add like, you know, 50% more code and get 20% less performance? Like, you know, it just didn't make any sense. It took me a really long time trying to figure out why, you know, or to kind of buy into the ideas of like implementation. Um, when you come up, and in what is essentially a procedural culture, it is very difficult to move to something that's declarative, right? That's one of the reasons I'm really happy to see so much closure going on, right? Because it challenges your assumptions about what a programming language is. Um, we find negative reinforcement all over the place. Um, it is difficult but not impossible to go against the grain. Um, but in my experience, it is very, very, very difficult go against the grain. Um, and I also think that we're not really learning object orientation today. I think uh, we learned some artifacts of it, but I think that uh, the, the kind of principles, the idea that inform what a lot of the new programmers coming up, going to school, think of object orientation, is actually antithetical to what it was meant in the beginning. Go back to the 60s, what they were talking about about objects, they're talking about modeling biological systems, right? I mean, how many of you guys are thinking about modeling a biological system in your code? You know, nobody. And it's really sad, um, because we should. All right, so at this point, I'm not sure if I'm, okay. At this point, I, uh, in my mind, I'm like self-doubting myself, and I think you're all like, what? Like, what does this do now? Like, that's just stupid. I'm wasting my time, and I should have left this other time. Um, so that's cool. That's cool. So let's kind of uh, let's uh, let's see what this looks like. Okay. So here's uh, an entity relationship diagram, right? We got our customer, we've got our address, and we've got our account. That's like a banking account, right? Um, and it's got like an amount of money in it. All right. So if we had this, and uh, we wanted to like ship an order to a customer, what would we do? Like how would we get the address to ship to this customer? Like what, what steps would we go through in our head? I would assume that customer would, would be an object as well as a- Let's uh, just assume it's this. Okay. I mean, from a strict database standpoint, I would assume there'd be a foreign key between customer and, that would, or there'd be a table that link customer and address. Well, there's a customer ID on address. Okay. I look up 
um, an adverse event, that's going to be based on the idea that I have. And then that would be the other three guys. Right, okay. So what you're doing is you're saying, all right, well, I need an address for this customer. You know, I've, let's say I've got this, you know, this data in memory representing the customer. So what I do is I say, okay, well, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask the customer for this piece of data. Then I'm going to go out and I'm going to say, hey, all you addresses, which one of you guys are, are valid for this customer, right? Uh, and I need to get all of the valid addresses for the customer so I can figure out which one I'm going to ship to, right? Um, now that's great for like relational theory and stuff, and you can prove this, and it's, it's good, it's an optimization. Um, let's flip it on its head. What if we're going to decrement like an account, the amount of money in the account, right? So let's say this is our customer person, and the wallet is representing the, uh, the account, and the money is representing the amount of funds in that account, right? So how, would, how do we go about taking the money? Right? What we do is we walk up to the customer, don't talk to him, we go directly to the account and take funds from it. Now, if I went up to you and did that, what would you do? Punch you. Exactly, right? That's like really rude. You know? And it's just it's just not a nice thing to do. We shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't be reaching in and kind of, you know, manipulating the boundary of this customer, right? The customer boundary is much bigger than just its table, right? We should ask the customer, what if the customer doesn't want to pay out of his wallet, but he wants to pay out of something else, you know? Maybe he's got gold balloons in his pocket, and that's what he wants to pay with, right? Um, we should let the customer decide, right? Is he a pirate? Right? <laughs> David, the, the, the economy is crashing right now, right? Yeah, yeah, good point. Maybe he's like a Glenn Beck who's like worried about the high inflation. <laughs> So the reason for this is because of formalism. This is a philosophy that just permeates every part of Western culture, right? And the philosophy basically goes like this. The universe, yeah, I'm gonna read this right away. Um, the universe is a very complex mechanism that operates according to discoverable laws. If man can discover those laws, he can use those laws to his own end and make things happen, right? All of our advances the last few hundred years have been on the basis of this philosophy, right? Computers themselves are on the basis of this philosophy, right? And this is like a death nail to writing good software, right? We don't want to do this. We want to challenge these ideas. Why? Because these ideas <coughs> are facts, right? It is that my computer's on a table, that is a fact, right? Um, Intelligence is not based on facts, right? It's the ability to do something with it. So we'll go there. So formalism is, as much as it you know, permeates the Western culture, it's like super heavy in the technical culture, right? It's computer science, right? It's software engineering, right? We just, we live and breathe this idea that, um, that you know, everything is just a rule that we can push. Um, it dominates even like you know, if you say, uh, oh hey, you know how's how's your uh, you know, how's this iteration going? How's your team doing? You're like, oh, it's great. We're a well-oiled machine, right? I mean, the metaphor there is that you're a machine, right? It's very formalistic. On the opposite end of this is a word that I've never heard before, but it's called hermeneutics, right? And this is like a counterpoint to formalism. It's a minority point of view. Um, you can call it postmodernism. Um, it started with the study of ancient text, right? But like sacred text, the Bible, Quran, older text, right? And what they were really trying to figure out is, well, what does that mean, right? Those words on the page, I understand what those words are, but when you put them together in this way, what does that mean? Right? It's really difficult to come up with like a scientific proof for meaning. Right? You can call it the study of semantics, or you can say that it is the quest for meaning. And what I am here today is to tell you that there is meaning in 
your software. What you do every single day has meaning inherent in it because it is intellectual complexity, right? I go so far to say that there is truth in it, right? What you guys do every day is a quest for truth, right? It is not just a rote sequence of steps or instructions to get something, right? There is truth and meaning in what you do. Okay, um, shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about metaphor. Metaphor is really important. It's uh, one of the 12, uh, I don't know, steps. <laughs> one of the 12 steps of XP. <laughs> uh, it's a really important part of XP though, right? I mean, it's not something that you would just kind of assume would be an XP. It turns out to be really super important though. Um, the world is a really, really big place. It's hard to understand, right? Um, and metaphor is key to us, uh, key for us to understand the world. Right, we think in metaphors a lot. Um, so let's go ahead and explore some metaphors and the reason for it. Again, it's hard to prove a metaphor, right? An object is a softball diagram, right? Or an object is a black box, you know? It's hard to prove, right? An object is a person. How, how do you prove that mathematically? That's, that's tough. Um, Metaphor helps us understand the truth of software, right? It doesn't help us understand um, like the output that we're trying to get. It's not a specification, but it helps us understand the truth. And that metaphor also helps us um, discover um, and decompose our application space into our domain, into an application. All right. Um, let's talk about how this. Uh, we understand this metaphor with objects. I hate command and control. I've been in too many companies that were a command and control structure, right? Um, one of the reasons as a, as a programmer I don't like it is I like to make decisions. And I don't like when the ability for me to make decisions is taken away. Um, I like to come up with better ideas. And there's just too much friction introduced in a command and control structure in that type of environment for me to work in, I just have decided I won't do it anymore. Um, what about our objects? You think our code is, is your code happy? Right? Does it, does it, does it get to make its own decisions? Right? Is it kind of fulfilling the, what it was created for? You know? I think too often sometimes we are command and control centric in our objects. In our creatures, right? We're creating these things. These are intelligent things that we're creating. Metaphor I want to talk about is theater. And I'm actually running late, this is awesome. I thought I was gonna be done in 10 minutes. Um, theater is a great metaphor for what we do as programmers, right? So um, our objects can be props. That's cool, right? You know, cause like, here's a pencil, it's on the stage, it's a prop. That's kind of like your value objects, you know, like a string or an integer. Objects can be actors though too, right? So if you're gonna go somewhere and uh, Series off and play. You want to see really good actors, and so objects can be good actors. And I'm going to, I'm going to abuse the metaphor. Stakeholders, I guess, could be writers. We're the directors, though, right? We're the ones who are directing the play. We're giving stage direction. We're asking for more emotion. We're telling them to turn it down. You know, this is supposed to be a serious moment, not a funny moment. We inform our actors on what they're supposed to do, right? And then they go out and do it. And I guess to really abuse it, our customers could be the audience because they get to enjoy the play. Um, now there are all sorts of kind of all sorts of plays. You have the one-person play. You got the cast of thousands, you know, with the huge orchestra and the spinning stage and all the light. And it takes like a year to prep it, and you know, then it goes around the world and plays for ten years. Um, the great thing about this metaphor, though, is that we can replace the actors in our play. Right? Someone gets sick. Or maybe they're just not very good. You know, we get a better actor. We don't have to go back and rewrite the entirety of the script. You know, we don't have to go back and change the stage direction. We may want to to take better, you know, uh, to make the most of our new actor, but we're not forced to, right? So, it's kind of a metaphor. Sorry about that. The greatest thing about this, though, is that 
you know, if you talk to actors, and you know, especially the BFR actors, you know, they also always talk about magic happens on stage, right? There's always something that you're not really preparing for, and that combination of actors on the stage responding to something unprepared for is magic, right? And sometimes it's so much better than what you were planning on doing, right? Sometimes that moment is just golden, right? And if we take this approach to our jobs as the directors of creating objects and putting them out in the play, we get to create magic. We get to create these moments, right? The sum is greater than the whole of its parts. Right? Um, I guess another good uh, metaphor would be amps. I'm talking about command and control. I mean, if you've never seen like an amp controller, you know, going around telling each amp what to do, because that's really inefficient and kind of stupid. Um, now, metaphors can be used for bad as well. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, I saw a lot, and I did a lot, <clears throat> an awful lot, is I would create rigid hierarchies. And this is how I learned object orientation, right? It's like, oh, Fido is a canine, and he's a quadruped, who's a mammal, you know? And then you just create this huge rigid hierarchy, and that's like really super bad, right? That metaphor doesn't work very well for what we're trying to express in, uh, in our application. Um, unless you're trying to create crappy code. By all means, go ahead. Um, we should focus on the assets of what our objects have and what they do, not on the category itself. Right? I just, as you, you know, I've seen that over and over and over again. And especially the Ruby community has really informed me that you, you know, don't focus so much on categorization of classes. Focus more on behavior. Um, so uh, I'll wrap it up. Um, we don't need to do more of the same. Like we don't need more tools. We don't need do what we're doing today to be a better developer, right? To build better code, to satisfy our customers more. The thing we need to do is we need to challenge our assumptions on what it is that we do and the importance of it. Um, and if we do that, kind of respect the culture where we came from, I think that we're all going to be a better program. And you know, just from my own journey, um, I'm so much happier than I was five years ago. And the reason is because I've, I've really embraced these ideas that were just like shocking and uh, appalling, I would just push away at first. Um, but you know, if I sound crazy, which I probably do, just give it a try. You know, but the thing is, is that we're dealing in intellectual complexity, right? We're not dealing in machines, right? We're not manipulating machines, right? We are creating and expressing an idea, and that's real power. So I want to end on a quote. I like quotes a lot. Um, Often people, especially computer engineers, focus on the machines. They think, by doing this, the machine will run faster. By doing this, the machine will run more effectively. By doing this, the machine will something, something, something. Why? They are focusing on the machines, but in fact, we need to focus on the humans, on how humans care about doing programming or operating the application of the machines. We are the masters, they are the slaves. This again, Shigeru Matsumoto, the creator of um, I don't want to say real quick, um, all the good ideas, well, I think they're good ideas. All the good parts of my presentation, if you think they're good parts, are from this book, Object Engine, by Dr. David West. My name is Mike Moore. My email is mike.blomodge.com. You can find me there or on Twitter. Any questions?